Again, a uh, very uh, brief introduction. We're going to take the next 12 evenings here in the, to end this 50 time, 50 days of of uh, extravagant devotion and uh, a time of extra time of fasting and prayer for the I- IHOP family, the IHOP team. And we feel like it's important, our leadership team, to give a sense of what the Lord has spoken over the last, actually, 25 years about uh, things pertaining to this very hour, to this very hour. And, th- and many things are yet future as well, but things we believe we're in a transition in this hour to begin to enter into some of these realities that are going to be shared over the next 12 nights. Why, why are we sharing this? First Timothy chapter 1, verse 18, Paul the Apostle says that, that Timothy was to fight the fight of faith using the prophetic utterances that were given him through the ministry of the Holy Spirit to the prophets. He told Timothy, he said, Timothy, those prophetic utterances, those prophetic experiences were meant by God to strengthen your spirit of prayer, your spirit of resolve, your obedience. And so if properly understood, prophetic ministry fuels up the house of prayer and fuels up the prayer life of the church, One of the reasons the prayer life of the body of Christ is low is because the prophetic ministry is low. People have asked me for years, how do you get uh, prayer uh, uh, motivated? I said, well, there's a number of answers, but one of them is through the release of the prophetic ministry, the subjective prophetic ministry, what the prophets are saying today, and the uh, teaching of end-time prophecy from the Word of God. And... For the most part, those two things are significantly neglected and they impact the prayer movement in a very, very direct way. And so those that want to see prayer uh, really uh, going to another level, they have to take the prophetic ministry serious. And it starts by believing in it, by believing in it. My journey into the prophetic ministry, I, I didn't I didn't believe in it. I was ambushed like some of you. I, the Lord began to, the prophetic ministry the ministry of the Holy Spirit in prophetic ways began to move around my life before I had any grid to even interpret it. And it was a bit dizzying in the early days. I didn't know what was happening. I didn't understand what these things meant. Now, having been in Kansas City for now uh, 20 years and having pastored for uh, nearly 18 of those 20 years, at Metro Christian Fellowship, I, I hear the question all the time, are these... Uh, prophetic words for the church, Metro Christian Fellowship, or the prophetic words for IHOP. And uh, I feel like that that's not exactly the right question, because the, the prophetic words, as you're going to see tonight, are really for the city in one way, much more than a ministry. It, it's not about uh, belonging to one congregation or one little prayer ministry. It's belonging to a city, number one. Number two, this is a new thing, because I've never pressed this point. I've believed it for years. I've never pressed it. There are very specific prophetic words related to the Midwest, of which Kansas City is in the heart of the heartlands. And and and, uh, even in the early days, Bob Jones pressed that point very strong, that these were words for the whole of the Midwest. And then, as you're going to understand... Some of these words have a particular application for Kansas City and St. Louis together. And that's a new piece of information for some people. And then some of the words have to do with what God's doing across our whole nation and and the earth. And so the real invitation of the Holy Spirit isn't to a little prayer ministry in Kansas City called IHOP or a little congregation in Kansas City of a couple thousand people. It's really to the believers in those geographic areas that say yes and amen to the Spirit and give their hearts fully to it and war according to these words and press into the heart of God with spiritual violence as lovesick worshipers. And so really the Spirit says it's for those that will say yes and move in with all of their heart. I'm going to begin, uh, because I have 12 nights and the, the way the nights are going to go, I'm going to share a bit during the evenings. I probably have 25 hours worth of testimony to draw from of things the Lord has done that are, that are unusual with their Holy Spirit mark of authenticity. I mean, I've been, I've received, as some of you have, thousands of prophetic words in 20 years. But there's those few that have that mark, not just, you sense they're right, they had a, 
a, uh, a, a confirmation, a supernatural confirmation. That's the word I'm looking for. And most of the testimonies I'm going to give are prophetic words that were confirmed in ways that could never be contrived or made up. They were confirmed by several different people or situations happening at the same time in the same place. And uh, I mean, in different places at the same time, very, very dynamic confirmations that were not just one guy said it and therefore there it is. And those, that's the majority of what I'm going to share are of the higher order of those that have been supernaturally confirmed by the audible voice of the Lord and angels and two people having the same dream the same night and those kind of things. But uh, the way these evenings are going to go, I'm going to share a while, a bit, and we have a whole, uh, I, I mean, a whole uh, testimony of things that are, that are in my heart from the last 20 years. But then we have another whole set of, of information from our team the Lord has been speaking powerful, powerful things in the last number of years in the midst of the prophets, the prophetic people related to the ministry here. I've heard it uh, said that whatever happened to uh, what happened in the 80s, and uh, we haven't publicized, we haven't made it known possibly in the way we really should have in the last five or six, seven years, but the, the many powerful things have been happening that will be surprising and very encouraging to uh, many of you that are in our midst because they're just as dynamic as some of the things uh, from the early days. Now, the most dramatic things in my life personally happened mostly in 1983 and 1984. So here it is, October 2002, 19 years ago, nearly 20 years ago. There was about an 18-month period and maybe five or six uh, experiences, five or six uh, things happened that are second to nothing I've ever experienced. I mean, the Bible that surpasses it. And what happened in 83 and 84 for about 18 months, about five or six uh, uh, periods of time in 18 months, it still remains near 20 years later to be the strongest things that God spoke in the most startling and stunning way. And I believe that he spoke them for such a time as this. But before I, I get into that tonight, I'm going to actually begin some of those tomorrow night. Tonight I'm going to create a context. Because I, as the uh, human leader of the FOTB missions base here and IHOP, I have so much information in my mind that some of the people joining us could not begin to understand what I think I understand, and they can't, I don't think they have any context for even placing some of these experiences. And so I'm going to uh, share uh, a few of the things that created my grid, my paradigm for what's happening in these days uh, in the generation the Lord returns is impacted by a few of the things I'm going to share tonight. First, very powerful to me, but not, uh, it wouldn't really make the list, because it's not of the order of the other things, but it was so powerful to me, and it formed, it has formed me so dynamically for 25 years, that I, I reason, I think, and I lead, and I even, I even administrate the prophetic out of this experience, very powerful to me, but it doesn't have the, the order of confirmation of the other things, but I'm going to share it anyway. I was 21 years old. I was uh, pastoring a church. I, I, my first church plant was when I was 20 in June 1976. This is on a winter night in 1976. I'm 21 years old. December 19, 1976. I go over to a, a family's house. At this point in time, though I'm, I'm pastoring a, a charismatic, non-denominational uh, fellowship, out in the rural area, I am not, I am not, I don't like the charismatics. I'm against tongues and I'm against a bunch of things at that time. But I'm in the midst of these people and it's a long story how I got there because I didn't uh, fully understand what I was getting into. But it's a church of about 50 people. It's out in the country. It's about six months old. It's, it's a Sunday night, December 19th, 1976. I go over to this uh, couple's house for dinner and they have this young lady she's been prophesying with a record of accuracy for some many years even by then and has since maintained that she's sitting at the table there's four or five of us she doesn't say a word the whole evening i don't really know her she doesn't really know me and i'm talking to this couple and suddenly the weather becomes very bad and none of us can leave none of us can leave and so we're all going to spend the night in this house and uh, we all uh, and we're all tired because it was a Sunday. We all got up early at about nine ten. We all retire. We're all gonna go to bed. So they get me a little sleeping bag, and I'm in the living room, okay. And they're all in the rooms, and 
And uh, about 11 o'clock, about an hour and a half, hour, hour and a half later, I am uh, uh, fell asleep. They came and they woke me up. And I went, yeah, yeah, what's happening? What, 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 is everything okay? They go, yeah. They said, our uh, friend here, the Spirit of God's moving on her, and she ha- wants to minister to you. It's the first experience I've ever had in my life. I said, well, 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 well what do you mean? She said, uh, she wants to, uh, she has something, uh, she wants to pray over you. They were being nice because I didn't, they didn't just say prophesy. They said pray over you, but now I, because I, I do that sometimes myself. We just want to pray over you, and I know where this thing's going. But uh, now in the 25 years since that evening, this is my very first Holy Spirit experience with any revelatory ministry, and it has formed my life for 25 years. It was one of the most, not one of the most dramatic in in terms of encountering an angel, and I've had a couple of those I'm going to share with divine information about the future. But I'm not going to tell, it wasn't of that order, but it, it, it was of, it, it impacted me so powerfully emotionally and intellectually and my understanding. And three or four times, in 25 years, I've had this unusual manifestation, and when it happens, I always pay attention. And it happened the very first time, is that, and not for many years after that, and then it happened again in 97, and it happened again when Kingsley Fletcher prophesied to me in January 99 about starting IHOP. And it's only happened a few times in 25 years, but it was the first night, and it happened, that while the, the, girl, the uh, young woman was prophesying, the wind of the Holy Spirit began to move around me. And it, in a way that was uh, uh, even the dullest young 21-year-old anti-charismatic pastor, I, I was taken back because I, there's this energy swirling around me. I'm going, well, I don't know what's happening right now. And the word was like going straight into me like an arrow. And uh, they, they had just uh, shaken me from uh, my little sleeping bag on the floor and said, wake up, we're going to pray for you about an hour and a half after I've been asleep. And, and all of a sudden... The, the three, four of them are praying, and the swirl, the wind is swirling around me. And and in a way, I don't mean to where, uh, you, you know, uh, like the flags on the back wall here would start blowing. But it was, it was, I'd never experienced anything of an overt manifestation of energy and wind swirling around me. And only three times or four times in 25 years has it happened. Like I, I said, in January 19... Uh, 99, when the Lord spoke to me the day that he made it clear to start IHOP, that happened when Kingsley Fletcher was prophesying to me. I didn't even know him, but I was paying attention. I said, oh, here it is again. It's happening again. This lady began to prophesy. My eyes were closed, and and my body was uh, just under the influence of the energy of the Holy Spirit. And I was just like, what is happening to me? It felt so wonderful. I felt like so, uh, uh, like I'd love to feel that way all the time, but it It doesn't happen that way. And here's what she told me. She told me five things. And these five things impact the ministry of IHOP and the Friends of the Bridegroom right now. She said, the Lord wants you to know that he is is going to lead you in many of the same ways that he led King David. He said, your life and your ministry is going to mirror in many ways, not 100%, the life of King David. Now, King David, I would just, I'd just been studying him uh, a little bit. My favorite was Paul. And if I had a, a choice, I would have picked Paul. And, and I remember uh, hearing this and in my mind not fully appreciating that, but the wind and the energy of the Spirit that was attending this word made me vulnerable and uh, made me uh, susceptible to it. And I just said, yes, Lord, yes. And, and I have watched in the last 25 years since that evening and what is happening here, many things rela- related to the life of David, his, his revelation of the personality of God, the fact of singers night and day, and a 24-hour prayer ministry with prophetic singers. And I don't even know that David's my favorite guy in Scripture to this day, but uh, I find more uh, things uh, related to that, and, I'm, and this could be a set of many, many people. It's not a unique thing, but this was a very important grid because... This was a model of how God was going to lead all the days of my life. And so many things happening in our midst will have a parallel to David's revelation, to the prophetic singers, prophetic musicians, on and on and on. The next thing she said, she says, and about King David, he says, God is going to give you a revelation of divine gentleness like King David had. And I remember thinking, divine gentleness. And... uh and the, the verse is Psalm 18, verse 35. David said, your gentleness has made me great. And that verse 
It's become very powerful to me in the last 18 years. I mean, last 25 years, Psalm 18, verse 35. But he said this, God is going to treat you with unusual gentleness in the way that he leads you. He's going to be gentle in his leadings towards you. This was so strange. But she told me later, she goes, and all that you do as you lead and God raises up leaders around you, he wants you to, to relate to people in the gentleness that God communicated to King David. Even when they sin against you, your enemies, you are to receive gentleness when you stumble, and the Lord will lead you in gentleness. But he's going to require that you relate to the people in gentleness in their errors, and even your enemies. And I remember that was so odd. I just wrote it down. I go, I don't have a clue what that means. And in 25 years, I, that is such a powerful word about I hop and what we're about. He said the next thing, she said the next thing, she said, you are going to have from now to when you meet the Lord, you are going to have, and this was really shocking, abundance of dreams and visions and heavenly experience, encounters with angels and those that God brings around you will operate in this as well. I've never had, I've never met anyone who's ever had a vision. I didn't even know what she was, I've never had a spiritual dream. She says, the rest of your days, not only you, but those around you that God gathers to you will have a multitude of dreams and visions beyond anything you can fathom right now. Your future is filled with dreams and visions. Angelic experiences, open heaven, heavenly encounters. Again, except the wind of the Spirit was moving on my uninstructed Little mind and little church experience, I had no grid, but I was made vulnerable by just the energy of the Spirit resting on me. Because I went, when they went to bed, I just, I just moaned and groaned and just said, God, yes. And then she said, here's the other thing. She said, God's going to make the Word of God the primary pillar of all that you do. The Lord insists on it, and He will awaken in you such a love for the Word, you will insist on it with the very fire that God insists upon it. The Word of God. And then she went on and said one more thing. She says, you will have many, many wars. As in the life of David, you will know conflict and you will know war. By unbelievers and believers. He said, when one is over, there will be a time of rest, a time of healing, and there will be another one on its way. Thus says the Lord. These five things have formed my mind and my thinking in so many ways. And they, 25 years later, it's a little over 25 years, I look back at those five things and I go, that was as clearly one of the most accurate blueprints for my future on five lines of, of, of divine, of, of spiritual principles. And those things are dynamically related to what we're doing and where we're going and how we do it. Okay, that's over. So that's my first one. Again, if it wasn't so formative to me, I wouldn't have shared it because it didn't have the, the other kind of angelic appearance kind of uh, dimension that these other, the, most of the rest of my experiences are going to have. But that's where it began. On that cold winter night on December 19, 1976, and I was in transition, and I've never looked back since. And uh, big things begin to multiply, and dreams and visions, and conflicts, on and on and on. Okay, now I'm going to talk about the two men. I have to introduce them tonight. The two men that have, uh, have been my spiritual fathers in, in different ways and at, at different times, Bob Jones and Paul Kane. When I look over my 30 uh, years plus of walking with the Lord... Those two men are, are significantly, clearly, I would have to call my two spiritual fathers through all these years. And then a third man I'd, I'd have to mention as a mentor. He was not really a spiritual father. would have been John uh, Wimber. He mentored me for three years in powerful ways. And uh, so I'm going to talk about them because these two men, whom I love dearly and respect dearly uh, this day, I'm going to begin with Bob Jones because he was the one that I met first. And Bob Jones, uh, from 82 to 92, from those 10 years, I had near, nearly, uh, daily communication with Bob. Not, that'd be a little exaggerated, but certainly many times in the course of a week for 10 years. And the revelatory experiences this man has had in my life, uh, in that, that 10 year period have just been, uh, profound, profound. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Bob's life. I'm gonna be just real brief. 
maybe just five or ten minutes on his life and about uh, five or ten minutes on uh, his uh, experiences that, that, are, that I believe help us understand the future uh, uh, in a way that is fully in line with the Word of God. And then I want to talk a few minutes about Paul Cain. Oh, by the way, they were both born in 1929. They're both the same age. They're both about, what, 74, 75, something like that right now. And uh, uh, they're born, born the same year, 1929. Bob didn't meet the Lord till he was 39. Paul Cain, very opposite. Paul Cain uh, grew up under a grandmother and a mother who were functioning in the realm of the Spirit in the most profound way in the prophetic. So Paul Cain had a heritage of prophetic ministry going back several generations. And Bob Jones grew up in an alcoholic family in the hills of Arkansas. He had two heavenly, he had two angelic experiences. Once when he was nine, once when he was 15, two different times. An angelic uh, visitor uh, communicated with him, which you'll find uh, when you uh, uh, go deep in the lives of some prophets. They had childhood experiences, some of them even before they met the Lord, where it was, it was like a, a divine hint of the way their life was going to be in the future. And the Lord was beginning to woo Bob. Uh, he went to the war, came home, became an alcoholic, was just absolutely burnt out in life. And uh, he went to the doctor. The doctor gave him pills. He got addicted to pills. So he had to go to the veterans hospital to get off the pills. And he said that was like, like a living torture to get off those pills because he's so addicted to them. And that was in 72, 73, whatever. In 1975... On August 7th, 1975, I'm saying it right, August 7th, 1975, that's right, he has a death experience. He hemorrhages uh, something, he just he starts bleeding internally, it's a, it's a, a longer story, and uh, he actually dies in, in that sense that he's, he's gone for a few minutes. And uh, 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 medically speaking, he would have been uh, real close to been pronounced dead, having bled to death, that kind of thing. Yeah, they rushed into the hospital, and all these things are happening, and and he sees two angels in this experience, and these two angels begin to talk to him about Kansas City and talking to him about the Midwest and the future. He said it numerous times in the years I was with him. He said it over and over and over. And I want to share it with you because though I don't think most of you have ever heard it, it does definitely impact the way I view what's happening because I believe it because of the, you know, the, whatever the number, the 25 experiences I had with Bob in the next 10 years that were proven beyond doubt that they were led of God. And I don't mean he, none of, neither Paul nor Bob Jones are infallible. I, I don't think it's uh, safe or I don't think it's... Uh, it's just not wise to put somebody in the infallible status. I, that's just, you have to discern everything. You have to use uh, team ministry, the gift of discernment. The Lord has to confirm it supernaturally. And so I, I wouldn't put Bob in that category at all. But his words, he has, uh, uh, these 25 that I'm thinking of are just absolutely staggering in their accuracy. But anyway, these angels, uh, in this death experience on August 7th, 1975, they speaks to him. And the angels say this to him. The angels say that, the, that God has chosen Kansas City and God has chosen the Midwest. God's chosen the whole world. If, if you want to know, God has a purpose for every place on the earth. So I'm not saying he's only chosen Kansas City. Don't go there. And two, you, not unique things, but two focuses of the Spirit's activity and the sovereign call upon Kansas City, and he told him the whole Midwest, is the word prophetic, the words prophetic and intercession. These angels told him that prophetic ministry is going to come out of the heartlands that will touch the whole earth. Now, there'll be prophetic ministry coming out of China and Africa to touch the world as well. This isn't the only place it's going to happen. But I'm not going to continue to qualify that because I want to stay focused on, on what... Uh, I just don't want you to think this is that. There's The Lord is the Lord of the whole earth, and He has strategic centers all over the earth of what He's about. He's uh, working for a global, a global symphony led by the head of the body of Christ, Christ Jesus. He's looking for something global to, to play the symphony of God's heart across the earth to reap in the harvest. So... I just want us to constantly uh, uh, not uh, lose sight of the big picture as I begin to focus on some of the things pertaining specifically to Kansas City and the Midwest. But the angels of the Lord uh, spoke to him that prophetic and intercession, there would be a measure 
there would be an abundant measure of prophetic and intercession. Now, this is happening in 75 with Bob. My thing happens in 76 a year later. So they're both kind of running parallel as the Lord's kind of uh, uh, getting us going, initiating us into this. I'm going to give you about six or seven things because they have significantly to do with what we're about at IHOP and what we're doing, but it belongs to any congregation that wants it, and not only in Kansas City, but the, all the whole Midwest. Number one, it says God is going to uh, cause Kansas City to be a city of refuge. There's going to be uh, several cities of refuge in America. Bob doesn't know how many. He doesn't believe hundreds. There's going to be, uh, he doesn't know the number. Cities of refuge. He says, but Kansas City is one of those cities. He heard this from the lips of an angel. Of course, he is wondering why is there the need to be a city of refuge? And the angel told him that there's going to be another great world war. That there is going to be yet another great world war that will bring devastation across the earth. And of course, I believe the scripture pronounces that in Revelation chapter 6, uh, verse 4. And I believe that this is yet to come. I believe in a, uh, a, a Holy Spirit interpretation of, of Revelation 6, 4. Uh, will lead us to the conclusion this is yet to, ha uh, to happen. I'm not saying that types and parallels of this have not happened in history, but this, the fullness of this is yet ahead. And I saw another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to this one who sat upon it to take peace from the earth. Beloved, let me say it real clear, because I have a, I have many, many reasons for saying this, more than this one, and I got Many, a bunch of Bible verses and a lot of experiences uh, through other prophetic people around the world. Let me say this real clear, because without, without understanding this, a lot of other things don't make sense. There is coming another world war, for sure. I just want to be that, I want you clear about that. Because most Americans are living and churches are praying as though there isn't coming another world war. And this dynamically affects my focus at IHOP, this reality. Anyway, ver chapter 6, verse 4, this uh, horse was granted, the one that set upon it, to take peace away from the earth. Peace is going to be taken from the earth one more time before the Lord returns. And it was granted that people should kill one another. It's granted that Killing would increase, and verse 8 tells us, in the middle, and powers, power was given to them over one-fourth of the earth to kill one-fourth of the earth with hunger, with death, and by the beast of the earth. So by the sword and by hunger, with death, and by beast, it mentions four things. And the angel told Bob Jones, there is coming another great world war, and this war, Bob understood, I don't know the exact words, this war would surpass anything known in human history, and I believe this so powerfully. There is coming another war, but the angel also added another thing. It didn't quote this verse, but it said this idea. There is coming great famine all over the earth. All over the earth is coming great famine. And it says it's uh, a number of other places in the Word of God. Now, here's what the angel says. That in Kansas City, when the war, the next great war breaks out and famine is all over the earth... God is going to cause Kansas City, there will be several cities in the Midwest and several cities outside as well. He says, I will cause this to be a city of refuge for this nation, not the only one, and even for the nations of the earth. And the Lord told the angel that this, he would raise up Kansas City to be a breadbasket. This was the language, actually. I said, Bob, they actually said that. He goes, yes, it would be as a spiritual and a natural breadbasket that would impact and be a blessing across the whole world in the time of world famine. The angel told him there would be supernatural finances generated in Kansas City and in the Midwest beyond anything that he could understand right there. He said it would be supernatural. It would go beyond anything Bob could comprehend. I believe in the Joseph Company. I believe there's going to be supernatural finances. I don't believe it just because an angel told Bob Jones and Bob Jones told me. I believe it for other reasons as well. Pockets of mercy where the agriculture and the economics would prosper even when there was not prosperity in other places. He saw a great light. The angel said to Bob, the angel said, look, suddenly. And Bob was startled and he looked. And there were, he said it was like an atomic explosion of bright, dazzling crystal light. It was Holy Spirit power. 
And this bright light broke out of Kansas City like an explosion, and it went, uh, it touched all over the Midwest initially in a powerful way, and it reached to the ends of the earth in strength. And again, there's going to be a number of cities of refuge uh, that are in the Lord's economy across the earth that are going to have these same kind of dynamics that are going to be taking place. And then the Lord told him that there was going to be young people. And he said that they would fill the stadium. He heard this from an angel. They would fill Arrowhead Stadium, which is Truman's sports complex. And the first anointing that would be on them would be the anointing of the prophetic singer. Bob doesn't even understand this. When I first meet Bob, he tells me this. He goes, the prophetic singers are top on the list on God's agenda. He's going to gather them and anoint them in the stadiums. And they're going to release an open heaven all over Kansas City and the Midwest and touch nations of the earth. And the Lord gave Bob a, a number of things uh, that would confirm that, and they happened. I'm not going to explain them for time's sake. My point isn't to prove uh, he was right. That was uh, uh, my challenge when I first heard him. I had to have proof, undeniable proof, that God really spoke through him. Not that he was infallible by any means, in any way, not in, in, in any sense of the word. But uh, the Lord proved that in ways beyond measure. I'll share that in the next couple of nights. But... Uh, Here's, I'm going to tell you what I believe from the testimony of many prophetic voices. I could possibly come up with as many as 25 different prophetic voices outside of Kansas City. Now, I don't mean just ones living here over the years who believe this. And let me tell you what the, what the Lord told Bob Jones. It says that on the East Coast, there's going to be limited nuclear exchange on the East Coast in the midst of this war, in the midst of this world war, and I believe that with all of my heart, I believe there's going to be limited nuclear exchange hit the East Coast. And he heard it from the Lord, and I've heard it from so many different people through, uh, around the year, uh, th through, uh, throughout uh, the, the, the nations over the last 20 years. And I believe there's going to be limited nuclear war touch the East Coast. And I believe that that limited nuclear war is going to create disruption on the coast that are, that's very, very strategic, very strategic disruption. The Lord's going to use it globally for, uh, for, um, uh, at, at, at many levels. Now, one of the most famous and one of the original testimonies of limited nuclear war on the East Coast would have come from our first president, George Washington. And uh, many of you are familiar with the, uh, the vision of George Washington and, and, uh, at, at, at Valley Forge, it's a very famous vision that is recorded in the Library of Congress where uh, he saw three great wars. He saw his own war, the Revolutionary War, and he saw that, that uh, he would be victorious. And then he saw a war related to Africa and slavery and, and, and brothers turning against brothers in America. And it's all written. He, it, was, it was written before the Civil War. And then there was one at the very end, at the very end, when fire bombs fell from heaven upon the East Coast, and there were fires breaking out everywhere on the East Coast. And I believe that with all of my heart. That doesn't mean that people should not raise up houses of prayer on the East Coast, but there is going to be, uh, and I don't, and I do believe there will be cities of refuge there, but I believe there's going to be disturbance and turbulence in our nation, and there's nothing more important, there's nothing wiser than to throw ourselves into the heart of God, begin to live lives of prayer and fasting, cultivate the prophetic anointing, begin to take serious what God the prophets are saying, turn it into fiery prayer furnaces and live like it's true. There's going to be limited nuclear war on the East Coast. There's going to be a multitude of earthquakes on the West. There's going to be, a disease will be everywhere, but it's going to be intensified on the West Coast. How much more reason to build a house of prayer on the East Coast and the West Coast? How much more reason to ask God to raise up a city of refuge? So I don't have clarity what they are, and, but God, the, God through His prophets will make that clear. I have no question that God through His prophets will make that clear. And the Lord is raising up the Midwest, several cities of refuge, and prophetic in intercession. He's going to raise it up because He's called intercession to be one of the primary redemptive gifts for the whole Midwest. Now, he went on to tell me that God put wheat in the Midwest like he put oil in the Middle East. And there, there is more surplus grain in the Midwest, like there's more oil in the Middle East. And the Lord has uh, done this very, very strategically uh, for, for every generation, undoubtedly. But there is a, a, uh, 
a crescendo. There is a, there is a drama at the end of the age related to the, the two great prizes. The whole global community will be after these two prizes, oil in the Middle East and wheat in the Midwest. And it's going to create a whole bunch of dynamics that none of us could fully understand. But the Lord told Bob, this angel in this experience, that the wheat would, uh, that, that there would be bread and there, in the time of famine and there'd be open heavens over cities of refuge where the rain would come and the crops would flourish where they were not flourishing in other places. And that Kansas City was the place, he said, I'm going to cause uh, prophetic and intercession to come forth in such intensity out of this city and go like bright light all over the Midwest and all over the Midwest back to Kansas City. But he says, it's going to happen here. And then in another, uh, another time later, uh, the Lord has communicated this to him in very, very dramatic ways. I don't want to, maybe I'll tell them in the, in the 11 days about the nation of Israel. And he said this, that it's very, very uh, much on God's heart to bring a, a tremendous harvest to the church in Israel. To the church in Israel. And I say specifically the church in Israel, because if the harvest comes, guess what? They are the church of Jesus Christ, because you can't be harvested, ex harvested except you're born again believers in Yeshua, Messiah, and therefore you become the church in Israel. I hear people talk a lot about the church or Israel, and we need to start talking about the church in Israel. Because that's where the revival is coming to the church in Israel. That's the concept of the prophetic scriptures. And the Lord told him how important the church in Israel was to him. And now listen to this. This was startling to me. He said that God called Kansas City to be a city of prophetic intercession and the Midwest. And they would function in prophetic intercession through the bread, through the finances, through the houses of prayer, all through the Midwest, through the prophetic ministries coming to a intensity. Now, as Bob's telling me this, I'm remembering my experience in December 19th, 76, thinking, I'm going to be around this from now to the end. He says, you have no idea the company of prophets going to be raised up in this city and all through the Midwest. As he is called, even before the foundation of the world, this for the Midwest, the very fact that Harry S. Truman was a man that God used politically in a, in a type of intercession for the nation of Israel. When the nations were against Israel in 1948, if there was one man on the earth, of course, it has to be God who did it, but if, if, we, if, we, that, if we understand that, we bring it down a level. If you had to ask Israel, if you had to ask the leaders of the earth in 1948, if there was one man that would have been MVP, most valuable player for Israel becoming a nation, undoubtedly they would have cho chosen Harry S. Truman. And this building we're in tonight is what? 100 yards, 200 yards from Harry S. Truman's house, the house he grew up in. Spent his whole uh, youth there. It's, they've got a, it's a museum. He says, do you know Harry S. Truman's house in Grandview? This is a year or two before I ever laid eyes on this building or ever heard of it. I said, no, frankly, I don't know about Harry S. Truman's house in Grandview. He says, well, you're going to get to know it because as you are called to intercession, and as he was a political intercessor for Israel, this movement will lead to a worldwide prayer movement that will be involved to birth the church in the nation of Israel. I said, I don't even know what you're talking about. And he says, you don't have to know. All you have to do is say yes each day when the Lord shows it. He goes, the years will unfold and you will have great clarity about what I'm telling you. He says, one of these days you're going to be right next door to him. And then he'll, he said, that will wake you up. A year or two later, in one hour, and I'll tell the story possibly how he got this building. It was so supernatural. Literally overnight. On May 15th of 1985, we were desperate because the place we were at said you had to be out by June 1st. We had no place. And we were in this building by June 1st. So, beloved, I believe that we have a, a very dramatic purpose with the nation of Israel. I believe there's coming a third world war. I believe there's coming a revival in the church of Israel. The Midwest is going to become fiery in intercession and prophetic. The Lord actually told him that about the Midwest, the 500-mile radius. This angel told him in this experience, the day I met him, the very first day I walked in the door and met him on March 7, 1983, he looked at me and he said, there's going to be a youth mo movement here. It's going to be of worshipers and intercessors. He goes, it's prophetic and intercession. It's going to be go all through the Midwest, and it's going to touch the nations of the earth, and it's going to be dynamically related to Israel. That was our first conversation. I didn't even have a clue what he was talking about. He says, you wait and see. It's going to come to pass. We'll talk more about that tomorrow. 
Now we're going to take about the next uh, 10 or, uh, let me see, I have about 10 or 12 minutes. Do I uh, talk about Paul Cain? And I'm going to give a, uh, a global dimension of what God has told Paul Cain in one of his most significant experiences as well. Most of you know that Paul Cain's uh, grandmother was a very powerful prof a prophetic woman, a prophetess, and so was his mother. Her whole life, she was uh, committed to prayer and fasting. Her name was Anna, and she was an Anna. She was one of the most devout women that you would ever know in ever. She's had five miscarriages, and she's 45, and she's pregnant. 45 pregnant, five miscarriages, three terminal diseases. She has tuberculosis, terminal. She has a, a terminal heart disease, and her body is filled with cancer. She's 45 years old, but the Lord told her when she was a young woman, she would have a son. She hasn't had a son. She's had five miscarriages. She said, Lord, she went home to die. The doctor said, go home and die. She said, Lord, you promised me a son. You promised me a son. I cannot die. You promised me. She was a Pentecostal woman in the early part of the, of the uh, 20th century, in the 1900s, where they were not very many Pentecostals in those days. The angel of the Lord visited her one night and appeared to her, touched her, said, Woman, you shall live and not die. She was instantly healed of every one of her terminal diseases. She was eight months pregnant. She said, The child in your womb is a male. You shall name him Paul. He shall go forth with signs and wonders. And the Lord would visit him and speak to him as a prophet. And, uh, all, and she was instantly healed. Now, here's the interesting thing about Anna. Because I had the privilege of being able to meet her a few uh, years before she died, when the angel touched her at 45 years old, she was so healed at 45, she went on to live 60 more years to 105. It's like she started over. It was like just he, he just gave her an overhaul. He just did the whole thing. Kidneys, liver, heart, teeth, everything. Just shoo, there she was. He goes, she never had a sick day in her life Tell maybe she was 95 years old. She has not told Paul about this experience. She said, Lord, you tell him. At eight years old, the Lord visits Paul. As an eight-year-old boy, appears to him and says, Paul, Paul, and told him the story. I visited you in your mother's womb. I healed your mother. I've called you as a prophet to the nations. Okay. <clears throat> Paul began to operate in, in, uh, in the word of knowledge when he was eight years old. From age eight to 18, d incredible miracles happened and and uh, I've heard stories of people who have been eyewitnesses of those miracles. When he's 18 years old, he begins to travel around America. He gets a 12,000-seat tent. He has the biggest tent in America for a year or two. And uh, miracles breaking. Uh, I remember once he went to Karlsruhe, Germany, and they had, what, 20,000? 30, no, 30,000 a night for 17 nights. And uh, I, met, I got to meet some elderly men in Karlsruhe. They said, oh, we remember Paul as a boy when the miracles were happening and the... And the uh, I mean, the creative miracles were taking place. He's 30 years old. The Lord appears to him, calls him, uh, tells him to pull aside and to wait upon him. And for 25 years, Paul calls it his near silent years. He's out in the, in the desert, literally in Arizona, in a little house, waiting on the Lord, waiting on the Lord. And the Lord gives him what becomes uh, uh, his most significant and open vision. And I believe this vision uh, so well because this is the very vision that God, the angel gave Bob Jones about Arrowhead Stadium being filled with people night after, just, I mean, continually with the prophetic song of the Lord in power to release signs and wonders. For 25 years, he's in his wilderness years from age 30 to, to 55. He says, here I had a world ministry. He was on TV in the 50s. 12,000 seat tent. And the Lord says, pull aside and wait upon me for another time, another generation. He sees what he calls the vision of the stadiums. He said, I saw it like a movie screen in front of me. It was like an open vision movie screen in front of me. He says, and in this stadium, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, broadcaster, the television broadcaster, the, the, the anchor man on the TV uh, says, we have no news tonight but good news. No news tonight but good news. No sporting events to announce. And what I believe that the stadium events are going to precede the big trouble that breaks out just afterwards. I believe the stadium events are critical to happen just prior to the breaking forth of this global conflict under this world leader called the Antichrist. The man of lawlessness that the scripture says so much about. And he said that he, the, 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 the TV camera was brought into the stadium. 
And the, and the cameraman was up at the top looking down, and the football field was completely jam-packed, and all of the uh, stadium was filled, and the multitudes were worshiping, and he noticed there were eight or ten on the stage at all times. He said that he didn't understand that, and most of them were young, and they were male and female. He says they were eight or ten at a time, and he heard the anchor man say, because I saw it a hundred times, the same way, the same sentences, like a movie screen vision, I, I witnessed it for years. He said, the guy said, Almost nameless, faceless people. Nobody knows who they are, but the same people remain under a, some kind of supernatural power for three days and three nights. The same people. Without food, water, or change of clothing. And they continue with a supernatural power. And he goes, look over there. And a couple of people were raised from the dead. And limbs were growing out and miracles were happening. Multitudes were getting saved. Uh, and as that team would go three days, another team would come on. And they would go one day, two days, three days under supernatural unction. He says there was always a whole team of them on the stage up there moving in the power of God. Most of them were young people and they were male and female. And then the anchor man, it went back to him, and he says, this is happening all over the earth. The Lord began to speak to Paul over and over this one term, and he said, it's Joel's army. He goes, I'm raising up Joel's army. Now, Joel's army is a term that uh, uh, critics have come against Paul because they misinterpret it, that uh, Joel's army is not the army found in Joel 2.11 or Joel 2.25. That's a negative army. That's an army of judgment against Israel. It's a, when Paul says Joel's army, it's a band of people across the earth. Like Gideon's army, like Joel's army. It's a band of people committed to fasting and prayer and the principles found in Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2 would be the reality that this army of believers lives in. And again, uh, Joel's army is not the army of Joel 2 verse 11 and Joel 2 verse 25. The reason I say that is because critics for years have been telling Paul those armies and those two verses are negative, And that's obvious they're negative and Paul's not using the word army to parallel or to reference those two verses, he's using it like you would say a Gideon band or a Gideon army or a Joseph company. He's using it in that language. But it's men or women living in the principles of the book of Joel. Now, when Paul came, he says, I've seen this a hundred times. I've seen this stadium vision. It's going to be led by people who live the lifestyle of the book of Joel, of Joel chapter 2. It's the Joel 2 lifestyle he's talking about. And we're going to get to that because Joel 2 shows up about five times in, in, in these 20 years in very, very dramatic ways. And God is wanting us to become a Joel 2 people, a Joel 2 lifestyle, a Joel 2 forerunners. He wants to raise up in this place and all through the Midwest, actually all through the earth. Joel chapter 2 is critical. Then, the very first time Paul Cain visits us. Paul Cain comes in, uh, his first visit here is in April 1987. He walked in, and then uh, afterwards he says, Mike, he goes, I had a startling, startling experience. He goes, you don't know me well enough to know how important this is to me. He says, I saw over this company of people, he said, I saw a banner, Joel's Army in training. I said, cool. He goes, you have no idea what this means to me. You have no idea about my stadium vision. I go, well, tell me. He goes, you don't know how it has sustained me for 25 years. Let me tell you something you don't know about yourself. He says, you're going to live and embody with a group of people the principles of Joel chapter 2. He goes, God is calling you into the book of Joel, particularly chapter 2. I go, well, I've read it a little bit. And I've had, I go, I know it a little bit. He goes, no, you don't. You don't even know it at all. He goes, you don't really even hardly understand Joel 2, but God's going to raise up a people that embody the reality of Joel chapter 2. He goes, the Lord wanted me to really emphasize that to you. He goes, God's going to unlock Joel chapter 2 to you in the days to come. And we're going to talk about Joel 2 because four or five other things have happened where Joel 2 is right on the menu of the Lord right now for IHOP. And it's for such a time as this, I, I want to tell one more thing about Paul Cain to introduce him. It was in June 1988. Now, this is going to be hard for uh, uh, some of you possibly to follow because I, I don't want to develop it. If you don't understand it, go ask somebody what it means because I don't want to give all the background b behind it. But uh, what happened is that Paul had a very prophetic dream about the nations of the earth in the end of the age one night. And he saw three, it's kind of like, Daniel chapter 2 with Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel chapter 7 with Daniel, where 
Nebuchadnezzar saw four political empires in four successive time frames piled up on top of each other. Now that's the part you may not understand. Daniel saw the same thing. He saw four empires in four successive periods of time, one following the other. And this is what Paul Cain saw. He saw three empires on three successive periods of time crescendoing into a divine drama that is staggering. It's June 1988. He goes, I've had a staggering dream. He was in Kansas City. He was shaken. Oh, wait a second. I got to say one more thing about Joel. It just comes to mind just now. He goes, here's why he's raising up a people committed to the Joel 2 lifestyle. Paul Cain, he's wide awake and he hears the audible voice of the Lord. He said this, to the church without mixture, I will give the spirit without measure. He said, one day I was sitting there one morning and I, I met him and he was, his face was just white. He goes, I just heard the voice of God. It went externally. It went through me like thunder. He said to the church without mixture, I will give the spirit without measure. And this is the Joel two lifestyle that the stadiums are going to be filled and led by people with this lifestyle. Anyways, I almost forgot that. Now, so I come this other time and Paul says, he goes, here's what I've seen. June 88. He said, I saw in America. Now, the, it was the election year. It was the election year. And it was George Bush against Michael Dukakis, right? He says, uh, the newspaper said, George Bush is fishing. And the point of it was, they wanted to communicate how relaxed he was. Instead of campaigning, he was on a fishing trip. He was just taking it easy. He was so sure he would win, he didn't care. It was kind of a political posturing. And the uh, Lord told him, he says, Bush is hunting for quail, and quail will hide behind the bush. Okay, now in June 88, no one ever heard of Dan Quell. And uh, he says, Bush will hide, is hunting for quail and quail will hide behind the bush. And then he says, within one year of George Bush becoming president, uh, not, God will knock the wind out of communism. I said, knock the wind out of communism? Now this is 18 months before November 89 when the wall comes down. And I went, do you know what communism is? <laughs> I go, he goes, yeah, I do. He says he's going to knock the wind out of it within one year of Bush finding Quell and becoming president. And he says, and then after that, he says, a little time is going to pass. He says, and God is going to raise up the residue of communism. He's going to mix it together with Islam, form an empire. It's going to be based in Europe. And it's going to be horrendously evil, and it will shake the nations of the earth. But God will raise up a church in Europe and a church in the earth that will stand against its tide with the authority of Jesus. So now, we go back. Those, those are the three parts. Paul goes, I don't know why I would have a global end time, international revelation about the end of the age, and have a riddle about quail and bush. He goes, I don't get it. Two or three months later, it announces, I believe it's in August, I can't remember exactly, but since August, September, probably August, George Bush picks a young guy nobody ever heard of named Dan Quell. And Paul came to me the day that was happening, he goes, look, that's his running mate, Quell, Quell. He goes, Quell. He goes, what do you think it means that Quell's going to hide behind the bush? And of course, George Bush was a war hero, Dan Quell. Uh, didn't have uh, the same status, status. We'll just leave it there. And so George Bush put his shoulders out and said, hey, I picked him. He loves America. He's a patriot. And he hid behind George Bush's uh, uh, military record as a hero. Bush is protecting Quell. He's hiding under his wings. So now in August, I go, wow, I believe part two now. Bush and Quell, which confused me. But now that it happened exactly, I go, I believe for part two. He says, you believe me to knock the breath out of communism. I go, oh, that's a hard one to believe. He says, well, the quail and bush one was pretty odd as well. I go, yeah, but this is a hard one. He goes, I want to proclaim this. Communism's coming down. I just couldn't believe it could really happen, to be honest. November, the election, George Bush wins. 12 months later, we're getting close to the 12 months. I go, Paul, Paul, it's coming close. November, the next year. The Berlin Wall comes down, and the dis, dis, whatever, what am I trying to say? The dismantling, thank you, that's the word in the news. The dismantling of the Soviet Union and all this. And I went, unbelievable. And Paul said, it's not about Bush and Quail in America for three months. The point wasn't that. And the point wasn't even about 
communist Soviet USSR within 18 months. He goes, those were only faith builders. The message is in the third part of the prophecy. He says, there is going to be a resurgence. There is going to be a new kingdom that's going to rise out of the ashes. It will be, it will have the spirit of communism. It will be mingled in with the spirit of Islam. It will be rooted in Europe. It will be horrendously evil and the whole earth will shake under its terror. The whole earth will be shaken by its terror. But God will raise up a church in Europe and raise up a church all over the earth which will be able to withstand its tear in the authority and in the victory of Jesus. Many will be martyred, but multitudes will stand in full love and they will escape it by the protection of the Lord and many things will happen. And Paul said, for such a time as this, we have come to the earth. Beloved, there's a war coming. I believe, I believe this. I'm going to end with this. And I, this is a giant statement to end with and I know it's not fair to end with it. And, uh, but I'm going to end with it anyway, because we're out of time, is that I believe that the political sovereignty of America will be temporarily disrupted. I believe there will be a short period of time where the political sovereignty of the United States will be interrupted temporarily. And I believe that there will be cities of refuge. I believe we will be occupied by foreign forces. This empire from, that was based in Europe is far bigger than Europe. I don't believe America will be conquered. I believe for a short season we'll be occupied. I believe there will be nuclear, uh, limited nuclear exchange on the East Coast. I believe there'll be earthquakes and plagues. I believe there's going to be a famine throughout the land. I believe there's going to be uh, an open heaven over cities of refuge. The rain will come. I believe that police forces will be disrupted. There'll be local governments in some areas resisting this, uh, this, uh, uh, military presence from, uh, uh, overseas regions will be occupied and other sea, uh, areas will be cities of refuge with apostles and the prophets leading the people of God, angelic visitations, signs and wonders, rain coming, supernatural prosperity, and there's going to be several of them in the Midwest. And it's critical that in the cities of refuges, there are 24-hour houses of prayer, people living the Joel 2 lifestyle. In the name of Jesus, amen. Let's stand.